<sighs> it's Monday, the 2nd of September, 2002, and at the World Sustainable Development Summit, the president of Zimbabwe at the time, Robert Mugabe, just gave this iconic speech. We don't mind having and bearing sanctions banning us from Europe. We are not Europeans. We have not asked for any inch of Europe. So, Blair, keep your England and let me keep my Zimbabwe. Fast forward to 2022, and in this beautiful country, just north of South Africa, the financial and economic situation is dire. The price of bread increases every day. The Reserve Bank just raised interest rates to 200%. The country doesn't even have its own currency, forcing it to use foreign currencies. People buy literally everything abroad, which means the country is quickly running out of money. And 74% of the population lives on less than $6 a day. But how the hell did we get here? How did things get this bad? That's what I wanted to understand, and I think I finally do. To help you understand, I need to break the story down into four important time periods, starting with 1980. People of Zimbabwe, victory is certain. Robert Mugabe's party won an absolute majority, many more seats than anybody expected. Triumph of Mr. Mugabe. It's all right for the Africans, but what about the whites? But what about the whites? This very question, little do we know, would be associated with Zimbabwe for the next 40 years. Let me explain. Prior to 1980, all financial and economic structures were under white minority control. Banks, businesses, farms, and so on. And the country used a currency called the Rhodesian dollar. But when Zimbabwe attained independence in 1980, things had to change, and they did. To begin with, the country introduced a new currency, the Zimbabwean dollar, to directly replace the Rhodesian dollar. The problem, however, is that white investors and the international community at large lacked confidence in the value of this new currency. Folks, my proposal is simple. Return to the original recipes and restore the M-Time brand to its former glory. At the time of its introduction, the Zimbabwean dollar was set to be worth more than the US dollar with one Zimbabwean dollar giving you about a dollar and 50 cents in US terms. The plan was to back up this new currency with mineral reserves, on top of the fact that Zimbabwe was very active in the global market, with thriving exports of agriculture and mineral resources. But over the next couple of years, things took a bad turn. Government interference coupled with looting and corruption resulted in this. The value of these reserves plummeting between the year 1980 and 2000. To make matters worse, export licenses were confiscated. This meant that that initial valuation of the Zimbabwean dollar did not reflect its actual purchasing power anymore. And in the official and black market, the value of the currency eroded. And I mean eroded. And just when I thought, okay, this is it. This is why things are this bad. <laughs> Enter the year 2000. We are prepared. We're about to go for home. Across Zimbabwe, up to 900 farms have now been invaded by ZANU PF supporters. I told them that we have come to occupy your farm. Basically, what happened was when the new government came in in 1980, there was an agreement at this house called the Lancaster House where the government was supposed to get land that was owned by white farmers back by buying it from those who were willing to sell it. This is the land we are going to have to acquire and in doing so, of course, we will be quite systematic and orderly and uh, proceed according to the Land Lancaster House Agreement. That means, of course, uh, compensate those whose land will be acquired. But by the year 2000, this agreement had been completely thrown out and Robert Mugabe ordered that there be the expropriation of land owned by non-black Zimbabwean farmers. We don't even know what the proper term is called. We, we messed it up long ago. Land re-exfoliation without comprehension. We don't care. We are exfoliating, Mariki. Without compensation. Regardless of whether you got the land legitimately or not, you just have to give it back. Not some of it, not a piece. Oh Lord. Oh Lord. And this was the big turning point because those who resisted were met with violence. Whites were singled out and brutally bashed. 
I got beaten up by the uh, so-called Sanupiev. Farms were burned down. Guys, people were killed. And once the land was taken back, the government now refused to give out title deeds to the new owners of this land. To make matters worse, farms that were previously productive and had state-of-the-art farming machinery were now in the hands of people who had never farmed before, who got these farms through political connections. But we can go for hours and hours about the politics of it all, the corruption and so on. I want to show you the economic impact of what had happened. As word broke out to the international community that this was going on, the following things happened. Firstly, sanctions were placed on Zimbabwe and certain people in Zimbabwe. And as you already know from my previous video, sanctions are meant to prevent economic benefit and trade with people whom they are placed on. However, they end up hurting the very people they're supposed to protect. Secondly, and this is very important, so listen, listen carefully. Listen properly. The collateral value of the land had reduced from billions of dollars to zero. This meant you suddenly couldn't use the land that you now own as a way to get a bank loan, either to send your kids to school, to buy a new car, or to buy and repair machinery on your farm. The country's agricultural production plummeted and they were forced to start importing produce. The land was completely worthless, zero market value. The foundation that we had established earlier of the Zimbabwean dollar had disintegrated and the currency fell into a bottomless pit of hyperinflation. Let me show you what that looks like. <laughs> When it's like this, it's equivalent to one trillion. So it's one trillion, one trillion, one trillion. So it becomes three trillion. When you when you have a dollar or ten rand, if you pay a dollar, you get three trillion change. This happened because the exchange rate went from you needing to have one Zimbabwean dollar to get one US dollar to needing ten Zimbabwean dollars to still get one dollar to a thousand, then ten thousand, then a hundred thousand in January 2006. And by June 2006, you needed to have 500,000 Zimbabwean dollars just to get one US dollar. So the government was like, whoa, 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 we weren't ready. Let's start over. So one month later in August 2006, they introduced a new version of the Zimbabwean dollar. Let's call this the second dollar. So you went to need only 650 Zimbabwean dollars to get one US dollar. So it was significantly better, right? But over the next two years, this changed dramatically. You went from needing 650 Zimbabwean dollars to get one US dollar to needing a thousand, then 2000, then 4000, then a million, then 70 million. And by July 2008, just 24 months later, you needed to have, I hope I can say this number correctly, 758 billion, 530 million Zimbabwean dollars just to get one US dollar. So again, the government is like, fuck that shit. We're starting over, but for real this time. So they introduced the third Zimbabwean dollar in August 2008 with an exchange rate of one US dollar giving you 1,780 Zim dollars. So significantly better, right? But over the next four months, and obviously this was peak 2008 financial crisis, but over the next four months, the country experienced hyper, hyper inflation. And the exchange rate went from you needing to have 1,780 Zim dollars to get one US dollar to needing 669 billion, with a B, Zim dollars just to get one US dollar. Let that sink in. But finally, on April 12th, 2009, the Zimbabwean dollar was officially abandoned. It's gone. This forced the country to start using a multi-currency system consisting of the US dollar, the Euro, the British pound, the South African Rand, as well as the Botswana Pula. This posed a problem though, because now all of a sudden, the supply of money was no longer in the government's control. 
the Zimbabwean government. This is because you can't print another country's currency. And this led to an even bigger problem where people couldn't get a hold of this new currency. People couldn't get a hold of US dollars. There was a point where you could only withdraw up to a limit of 50 US dollars at the ATM after queuing for hours and hours, sometimes even days. So people started panicking because the country was literally running out of money. So the government was like, Oh my God, okay, it's happening. Everybody stay calm. What's the Everybody procedure, everyone? Calm. What's the procedure? Stay calm. Wait, 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 wait. Everybody just calm down. And this went on for a couple of years until the government said, we need a solution. And they came up with an idea. Hold on, let me show you something. They came up with this RTGS currency, real time gross settlement currency. And it came in the form of Zimbabwean bond note dollars. If you wanna use a US dollar, we can't print it for you, but you can use one of these. And I have here 40 bond notes. So essentially, according to the government, this is equivalent to 40 US dollars. They were like, no Nobody's one's gonna, gonna know, know. They're gonna but know. People knew, and as you can imagine, very quickly, these bond notes lost value on both the official markets and the black market. I know I've been saying official and black market for quite some time. Let me explain why. In Zimbabwe, you have two parallel economies operating side by side. On one hand, you have the government, your banks, your big, big businesses. On the other hand, you have small scale farmers, small business owners and street vendors. This is not unique to Zimbabwe, but it's particularly important in Zimbabwe because the exchange rate for bond notes to US dollars is not the same at the bank and on the streets. So if you're a teacher and you get paid in bond notes, suppose you get paid 30,000. When you go to the bank, you have $100, cool. But by the time you get to the streets where you most likely spend your money, you have less than $40. Say you're in a queue to buy bread. The first 10 people pay 10 bond notes. The next 10, 11. The next 10 people pay 12 bond notes. So by the end of the day, the price of bread could have doubled or tripled. You're literally watching your salary disappear. And so you end up in a situation where no one wants to use this currency, but you don't have a choice because if you're a civil servant, if you're working as a teacher, a nurse, a doctor, the government pays you in bond notes. So your salary as a doctor literally disappears. That's why you end up seeing highly skilled, highly educated people coming to South Africa, working odd jobs. And this is painful to say, but it's easier for Zimbabwean people to take a pay card or work for a low paying job in South Africa because you'd still make more than you would working in Zimbabwe earning in bond notes. So the next time you hear someone saying Zimbabwean people need to go home, they need to go home, just take a minute to think about that. Think about what that really means.